All right, I'm going to get started. Just so everybody knows, I am recording this session. So for those who can't make it, um, or those who perhaps have to leave early or come late, there will be a copy of everything. So welcome all to today's informational webinar. We're really excited about the turnout and about the interest in our Sandbox program. And I'm hoping that today we'll be able to answer all of your questions about our current call to join the Augmented and Virtual Reality Sandbox. My name is Emily Carlisle, and with I am the Digital Program Lead at eCampus Ontario, where I lead our Educational Technology Sandbox and other emerging technology programs. And with me today is Joanne Kehoe, the Associate Director of Educational Technologies at McMaster University, and also the former Program Manager at eCampus Ontario. Joanne led our inaugural Educational Technology Sandbox, so I'm sure that many of you have worked with her in that capacity. Michelle Singh, our Chief Technology Officer at eCampus Ontario, is also with us on the call, and he will be monitoring the chat and answering all your questions throughout. So if you have any questions about what we're covering, please feel free to throw them in the chat and he will get to them. Over the next little bit, we want to answer some of your key questions about the sandbox. In particular, what is the Educational Technology Sandbox? How can you apply to be part of the sandbox? And what is Creator AVR, the tool that we are testing in this current sandbox, and how can you use it? And then at the end, we will have an open question and answer period to answer some of the key questions that come up in the chat or any questions that are remaining. I also want to let you know, though, before we move into anything else, that um, I have had some questions about the application. So I'm just going to answer those up front. We've had some people ask if there is an, education, uh, an application form, and there is not. <laughs> All that's required to apply is a less than two-page Word document addressing each of our submission requirements, which you can then send to the procurement email that is posted with the call. But I do know that we are working with a tight timeline, so I have gone ahead and created a template for you in English and French with the help of Michelle. And I'm just gonna post the link to those in the chat here. Um, so if you have started your application, there's no need to adjust it to fit with this template, but the link is there if you want and you are welcome to use it. So I'll come back to some more questions that have come up about the application shortly, but for now, some of you may be familiar with eCampus Ontario. We are a government-funded, not-for-profit consortium, and our members include all of the 45 publicly funded institutions in Ontario. So that's 24 colleges and 21 universities across the province. And one of our core principles is building space for members to connect and collaborate with one another. We want people to cross paths and we want people to have an opportunity to contribute to thinking about problems and solutions that have the potential to impact the whole province. And one of the ways that we're doing this right now is through the provision of shared services in which we aim to leverage the strengths of the system through purposeful collaboration. Now the image on this screen is by no means an official document, but it shows that we are currently providing four types of shared services commodity, scale, emergent, and open alternative services. The educational technology sandbox falls under the emergent pillar of our shared services because it's in the sandbox that a limited number of our member institutions test new tools and platforms, basically like a pilot project. And key to the sandbox is the reporting piece because those who are testing the new tools work to analyze their effectiveness and the impact of the tools in educational and teaching settings to gauge whether there is any value in offering that tool more broadly through one of our other shared services pillars. So that's a benefit that we see, but what about what's in it for you? I'm gonna turn it over to Joanne now to speak about some of the benefits and outcomes that came out of our first sandbox a few years ago. Okay, thank you, Emily. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Happy October 1st, it's a beautiful day out there. Um, thanks so much. I just wanted to inform, or just talk about briefly the sandbox version one experience, which I was involved with when I was a program manager for eCampus during the 2017-2018 period um, to highlight in particular the one um, project that we had with Labster. 
and in the hopes that some of the things that we did and the things that we learned might help you as you explore whether or not you want to engage with this opportunity. So in fall 2017, we had 1,200 licenses available from Lobster. Uh, we were very fortunate to have lots of interest and we uh, distributed those licenses between the seven colleges listed there and these uh, five universities. Um, we really just wanted to provide an, al an alternative for the learning experience for students, you know, things that would normally involve costly equipment, hazardous, hazardous materials, techniques, access to physical spaces such as labs that are sometimes difficult to provide equitably across students, programs, and locations. Um, so you can go to the next, next slide. So we were really fortunate that all of the application, applicants had this, uh, the things that we were looking for. So that vision for the project, demonstration of that there was a high impact for the learners, that they had a team developed that were committed to the project, and they were also committed to um, communicating back what the experience was as well as the value and some of the learning to the other to Ontario post-secondary community so just on that communicating value to all thread I'm gonna pop in the chat the link to the sandbox report so you can see more detail on some of those use cases and what we discovered um, during that process so the next thing is about integration so just a real, real quick summary of how some of these simulations were integrated and may help you as you try to figure out how you would want to maybe integrate some of the AR, VR um, for this particular opportunity. So I won't go through them all, you can read them, but just to highlight a couple, the, low, the assessment piece, we found that on the whole they were low range, so ranging from 5% uh, to 15%. Uh, the before class component um, some of, in some cases, the completion of the simulations were prerequisite for actually entering a physical lab space. As far as the bonus activity goes, uh, this was usually a bonus mark, but also could be tied to the quiz, quiz or exam questions. Uh, there's other integrations there. In the face-to-face -face blended and online class, I thought I'd just highlight one particular example from the University of Ottawa who integrated, integrated the simulation into, I don't know if anyone's here from Ottawa, but integrated into the same course twice under different delivery formats. So once in the face-to-face -face offering in the fall and once in the online offering in the winter. So that was kind of an interesting exploration and their survey results indicated really positive feedback. Um, also wanted to highlight as part of a larger research project, the U of T project. I think I saw Lori's name, Lori Harrison is here from U of T. So they did a really amazing job um, collaborating with Labster with their online learning strategies and IT departments. I'm going to pop the link into their final report because it's quite interesting. I don't know if it went over there. Oh, I did it twice. So anyways, they had a really great process as far as involving everyone in the identif identification of the relevant labs, designing their course curriculum around those labs, addressing the, the IT integration and support aspects and integrated into four undergraduate courses and then evaluated it. One interesting component of this particular research project was a PBL component where students actually critiqued the labs as part of the learning process, which was cool. Um, the question, I don't know, question, oh, question in the chat, blended asynchronous or asynchronous or both? Um, it was a synchronous experience for this particular um, case study. So I can definitely find out more information and give it to you, James. Okay, what, you can move on. Yeah, what we learned, great. So what we learned was uh, these things, but because the virtual labs could be completed at times and in places convenient to the students, this really helped meet a desire for flexibility. So that control over pace and progression was a big factor. Um, we found that the experience improved their uh, critical thinking and mastery of skills because they could test and retest their understanding of concepts. Um, and not mentioned in this slide, but also I thought I'd just highlight was Labster included an instructor dashboard. I don't know if Creator VR does the same thing. But um, so information about the number of attempts and the student's progress in each of the labs was available to quickly, for the faculty member to quickly assess individual student performance. You can carry on with the next. This is just a real quick snapshot, but I'm happy to go into deep 
uh, deeper detail with anyone if they want to. So what else we learned was that it was, sorry, yeah. Actually, yeah, back one. Right, yeah. So that the simulations really address different learning styles. So you think about concepts and processes that are in introduced in a unique and visual manner, as will be the case with this project as well. So you can kind of observe the otherwise unobservable, which is pretty cool. Um, lots of other things that we learned there. I just wanted to highlight about the accessibility. Um, it was really important, or it was really a, a great feedback from the students that they were happy that they weren't required to complete labs within a certain time limit. So they had to, that control again was very important to them. Um, some of the feedback too on the simulations were used to improve them. So things like color contrast we were, was, were fed back to the vendor. So that experience also improved the, um, the uh, um, simulations themselves. Okay, next. Yeah. Finally, just to highlight a couple things. Um, some of the downsides was the virtual, it was really challenging for um, our partners to align the content to learning outcomes. So there was a strong need for customization. Um, so in some cases, because these simulations were already developed, students were exposed to content that really, that at times didn't have any relevance to their course learning outcomes. So that was a big challenge. The length of the labs, again, was challenging. Um, at the University of Guelph in particular, they wanted to embed the simulations into their face-to-face -face tutorials, which were 50, 45 minutes in length, I believe. And the labs themselves were 50 minutes. So that was a bit problematic. So not having the ability to take out content. Um, at the end of the project, we asked who, was, who were planning on using the lab simulations in the future. For those that weren't planning to use them, that was mainly, again, because of that inability to customize the labs to program and course learning outcomes. And there was also that coupled with the uncertainty around cost and how that would be sustained. For the institutions that reported that they would, would be likely to continue integrating, they were able to integrate the project, uh, the virtual simulations project, with their institutional priorities. So that was one takeaway. Um, and one institution in particular surveyed their students and they indicated a willingness to pay for the labs if the cost was manageable and if it replaced the textbook costs. So that's a really, really quick snapshot. Um, just the big thing that I learned that is that however beneficial this VR virtual simulations opportunities are, they can't be used in isolation, that they have to be crafted around solid design, course design, learning outcomes, and a plan for integration with feedback. So again, very quick, but I'm happy to answer any questions offline. I know Emily has a lot of content to go through. I'll put my email in the chat and please reach out if you have any questions. All right, thank you so much, Joanne, just for giving that extra context about the inaugural uh, sandbox program that we ran and some of, uh, some of the lessons learned and benefits and outcomes of that first pilot project. Um, but if you are here today, I assume that you've seen the latest call to join our sandbox, which marks the official launch of our 2019-2020 sandbox. As you would have seen in the call, we have purchased 1,000 licenses to a platform called Creator AVR, which is an augmented and virtual reality platform where 3D models can be viewed in augmented or virtual reality or in mobile touchscreen mode um, with either a single user or multiple users at any given time. And I'll get into some of the details regarding how the platform works shortly. But for now, you should know that Creator AVR addresses some of those concerns that Joanne just mentioned that came out of the virtual simulation sandbox, in particular by allowing for customization of content around learning outcomes um, and, and course goals. It also exists as a low barrier to entry for people who are interested in experimenting with AR and VR in their teaching, but haven't previously had opportunities for any given number of reasons. So by this, I mean that no programming skills are required to use the platform. And because it is compatible with various mobile devices like Androids, iOS devices, as well as PCs, you aren't necessarily confined to specific or expensive hardware in order to use it. But with that being said, head-mounted displays would allow users to immerse themselves in the full VR experience. So in addition to licenses to Creator AVR, we are aiming to include with this pilot 
a few head mounted displays to get you started. Um, and if you are interested in getting more, it is compatible with um, some of your standard head mounted displays like Google Cardboard. So I know that I've had some questions about that and hopefully that answers those questions. Additionally, the vendor will provide some content creation support if you are requiring or want customized 3D models. And we will provide all onboarding, onboarding training to get you up to speed. In fact, because we really want to get educators using Creator AVR as quickly as possible, that onboarding will start with a workshop at Mohawk College from October 21st, 1st to 23rd, with travel costs covered for up to two members of a pilot team. Now that's not to say that you can't bring more members of a pilot team if you have more members, um, but the travel costs would be covered for up to two. And in general, with this pilot, we will provide you with a collaborative environment to sort of meet and introduce and work in the same space as educators at other institutions. But to be considered for this pilot, we need your application. Faculty, instructors, and staff from our Ontario member institutions are all welcome to apply across any range of disciplines, and French language submissions are encouraged. So I'm going to repeat for those who joined maybe a little bit late, but if you missed the beginning of this session, I have shared an application template in English and French in the chat that you're welcome to use to shape your application, and I'll just go in and copy it. Um, to everybody again. So the templates are there in the chat, um, which you are welcome to use for your application, though you don't necessarily have to. Regardless of how you are submitting your application though, there are four things that we want you to include in them. And I'm gonna go through each of those, but want you to keep in mind that you aren't stuck with anything that you write in it. We do recognize that it's early days, that it's a tight timeline, and that use cases might change as you learn more about the tool. So starting with the first submission requirement, we are asking for a description of the courses and or teaching settings in which Creator AVR will be piloted, as well as the estimated number of licenses that are needed for your use. So there's two things that I wanna note here. First is that if you're a faculty member, tell us about the course or courses that you plan to use the tool in. If you're working in a teaching center, tell us about the courses you'll partner with or the workshops you'll run using Creator AVR. There's really no right or wrong answer here, except that we want these licenses to be used and we want them to be used to support teaching and learning. So that's what we're getting at with this requirement. Second thing is that I have had questions about how many licenses applicants should apply for. So to clarify that, any student, instructor, or staff member who will need to access the content on the platform will require a license. So if you have 100 students registered for a class, ask for 100 licenses for those students, plus however many more you think instructors, staff, or teaching assistants will need to access the platform. As for how many licenses you can ask for in an application, it's really hard for me to ballpark that because I anticipate that some people might only need 30 for their use and some people might need 300. So I would say ask for as many as you need or think you'll need, but just keep in mind that we are distributing these licenses across several institutions. So don't ask for all 1,000. For submission requirement number two, we are asking you to tell us about your purpose for participating in the pilot, including what pilot implementers like yourselves aim to learn, what you hope your learners will learn, and how Creator AVR will be used to support learning outcomes or skill development. So by this we mean, with your teaching setting identified, this is your chance to tell us why you want to participate in the pilot. From our end, we're trying to determine whether or how Creator AVR can have value in teaching and learning settings. But from your end, tell us what you and your pilot or you and your project team hope to learn about the tool and your teaching. Tell us what you hope your learners will learn by engaging and being part of the pilot. And then give us a sense of how you plan to incorporate Creator AVR into your teaching settings. So this idea might evolve later on, and again, there's really no right or wrong here, but <clears throat> maybe at this point you hope to build lessons that students can interact with alone. Maybe you'll be basing in-class group work around the modules, or maybe you'll 
get students to build content as part of an assignment. The choice is really yours here, and I'm hoping that as I move into describing what you can do with Creator AVR, you might get some inspiration. So for the third submission requirement, we are asking you to tell us your proposed method of measuring the impact of Creator AVR on teaching and learning. So as I mentioned earlier, the goal of the sandbox is to test the value and impact of different tools in teaching and learning settings. And we want evidence of that impact. So this question is intended to get you thinking about how you will collect and report that evidence. Now later on during the pilot, I'm happy to work with the different groups to actually refine these methods and um, establish them and report on them. But for now, maybe your answer is that uh, you'll, you'll incorporate student feedback surveys. Maybe it'll be informal observations or conversations with students. Or maybe you're gonna use the metrics that are built into Creator AVR that I'll show you shortly. Whatever it is, it should make sense given the use case that you write about in your application. And for our final submission requirement, we are asking for the name and position of the project lead and other collaborating team members who will be implementing or working with you to implement Creator AVR. We're also asking you to include here the name of the team members who will be attending the workshop at Mohawk College on October 21st and 23rd. Keeping in mind again that we do cover travel for up to two members of your project team. Now you are welcome to submit an application alone if you just want to pilot this, uh, if you want to pilot Creator AVR in your course. But we do encourage collaborative submissions and they are most definitely welcome because the whole idea of the sandbox is to facilitate collaboration around new tools and technologies. So you're welcome to work with other instructors or faculty members, to work with instructional designers, to work with learning technologists, basically anyone to share the load um, or to bounce ideas off of. And if you are collaborating and your team plans to use Creator AVR in multiple educational settings, then one application is completely suffi su sufficient. Um, you can cover all of the different use cases in that one application and submit it. So those are the four submission cri criteria, and I hope that those, ex those further explanations helped. But if you do have any more questions, and I see that the chat is very active right now, um, Michelle will continue to answer your questions about the requirements as, um, as I move forward with this presentation. Um, but for now, I want to talk about what you're even applying to test, which is Creator AVR. So for the rest of this session, I'm going to introduce you to some of the features and capabilities that Creator AVR holds, which hopefully will get your creative juices flowing. So first things first, Creator AVR can be accessed through a web login or by downloading the app from Google or the App Store. It's a drag and drop software platform that allows users to create interactive and immersive AR and VR learning modules using 3D models from the platform's large library or models that you've built on your own or found elsewhere. And there are open models out there on the internet. Um, the learning modules are built and then viewed in the interface that is shown here. And as you can see in this image, users can choose to view the module in mobile web view, which looks something like this, in augmented reality, or in virtual reality just by clicking these buttons uh, that I've highlighted on the screen here. A mobile web view is accessible through PCs, Androids, or iOS devices. Augmented reality view, which looks something like this, where the digital 3D model overlays a real world setting, is made possible by scanning a QR code with a mobile device, as shown in this image. And then virtual reality view is made possible through head-mounted displays, which allows users to insert a smartphone into it and then place it on the head in front of the eyes. And as I said before, we are aiming to provide successful applicants with a few head-mounted displays to get you started. But if you're interested in, in getting more after that, then it is compatible with um, standard, standard displays like Google Cardboard. 
Now to create your content in Creator AVR, we will set you up as an administrator so that you'll be able to see all of the content created by other members of the pilot project, as well as some lessons that are already in the system, which looks something like this. And you're welcome to use the lessons and the modules and the courses that are already there um, or to adapt them for your own purposes. But if you, are, if you want to create your own content, then first you'll create a course to put all of your lessons in them for your learners to see. And then you'll move forward with creating your lessons for that course. And to build a lesson, you first choose the 3D model that you want to build learning content around. That could be a model from the more than 1,400 that are already there in the platform for you. And these cover a broad range of disciplines like chemistry, microbiology, anatomy, geography, mechanics, and engineering. And within the platform, we've got plants, lungs and hearts, molecules, motors, gas turbines, historical landmarks, and so many more. So you're not, it, it's not limited by discipline. Um, but, you can also upload a 3D model that you've found on the internet or that you've built or had built for you. Because remember, the pilot does include content creation support from the vendor. And then once you've got your model in place, you can enter this interface where you'll be able to build an interactive and immersive, immersive lesson or else just save the model as is for learners to explore at their own pace. If you do choose to add interactive teaching elements, there are five options which I'm going to cover now. So the first is that the memo, uh, the memo activity, which allows you to add contextual information like annotations or labels to the model in any language simply by clicking the part of the model that you want to annotate. So you can see here that they've labeled the different parts. You can also add audio voiceovers and supporting media elements like YouTube videos to give context to certain parts of the model. Again, just by clicking the part that you want to add audio or media context to, and then recording a voice clip or pasting the link to the media item. A build activity deconstructs the model and has learners put it back together in a set amount of time. And the locate activity asks users to point to a certain part of the model while the identify activity works in the reverse. The system points to a part of the model that you've asked it to, and then users will enter the name of the part um, that it's been pointing to. And then finally, we have multiple choice questions, um, which is self-explanatory. You are able to enter any question and answer options that you want in the language of your choice so that it's a customized question. And then one final way to engage learners is to record yourself interacting with the model as you view it from different perspectives. So you could be pointing to different parts of it, you could be moving, moving it around and looking at it from different perspectives, you can deconstruct it, you can view it in x-ray view, and then you can record yourself uh, with an audio voiceover as you do so, so that you're really guiding learners in exploring different parts of the model and learners will see this and be able to play it when they access the platform. And then when you're done creating the module, you can save it with learning outcomes identified or learning objectives identified, and then links to different course materials like a slide deck or a PowerPoint, which really gives you an opportunity to think about how you'll use Creator AVR to support teaching and learning outcomes in different settings. So now that you've created your lessons, you're going to want your learners to view them. And to do this, in the back end, you or us will be able to bulk import your learners using an Excel document, at which point they'll then be able to log into Creator AVR and see any courses or lessons that they've been added to. And depending on um, the device that they're using, it'll look something like this. They'll have a list of courses that they've been given access to, and then they'll be able to view the different lessons in that course and select them. And after selecting a lesson to view, the learners will then be taken into the lesson where they can interact with the model on their own in any view that they like. Uh, so again, just like you could, they could view it in AR, VR, mobile web view, um, in x-ray view from different perspectives. They could deconstruct it. Or if you put a lesson in there, then all they have to do is hit play and then they'll be taken through the different interactive elements in the order that they've been entered into the lesson. 
And as they engage with the model, uh, with the different lessons, their progress will be tracked, just like um, Joanne said with Lobster. So you'll be able to see from a dashboard um, how much of a course or a lesson a student has completed, the date that they completed the lesson, the amount of time that they spent on the lesson, and the total score for all activities in that lesson. So this could be a useful piece um, for assessing your learners or to track the impact of creator AVR on teaching and learning. As we talked about, this could be one of those evidence pieces for reporting on the value of the system. And so as I wrap up this overview of Creator ABR, there is one more feature that I want to highlight, um, which is the synchronous learning mode, because I know that there has been some interest from our audience in how this works. So in the system, a teacher or a student is able to log into a lesson and then launch a synchronous session, which others are then invited to join. And this could happen from the same room, it could happen from different cities just over the internet, but it really allows students to see what that teacher or the person who launched this session is seeing from that person's perspective. So you'll be able to see their screen. And then in this synchronous mode, users can talk to one another or the teacher can just demonstrate particular aspects of a lesson, like highlighting certain elements of the model that are important or showing a, a, a certain process. So that's another feature that may be useful in the use cases that you're thinking about. Um, and that's really the gist of Creator AVR. But as I mentioned, we will make sure that all successful applicants are thoroughly onboarded so that they can use the platform seamlessly for, the different, for their different intents and purposes. And myself and the vendor and our team at eCampus will also always be available to answer any of your questions about the platform or the pilot more generally. So as I conclude this session and before I open it up for the question and answer period, I want to re reiterate that this pilot is a great opportunity for those who are curious or new to, to augmented and virtual reality, but haven't had opportunities to implement it in teaching settings before. It's also great for those who are more experienced and who are looking for opportunities to experiment with and review new tools and in different teaching settings. And then it could even be great for those who want to give students opportunities to either experiment with building lessons or learning materials or building augmented and virtual reality content. Um, it's a good opportunity to begin thinking about how to incorporate these kinds of emerging technologies. So with that, I look forward to hearing about the different use cases that you're thinking about and to reading your applications, which as a reminder are due on October 7th, that's next Monday, to our procurement email address, which is shown on the screen right now, but is also um, listed in the call. So I know that the chat has been active and I know that Michelle has been monitoring it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to highlight some of the key questions that have come up and share, um, share the answers and thoughts with the rest of the group. Hi, thanks, Emily. Yes, there was a lot of um, questions in chat. Uh, some of them, we do have the answers. Some of them, uh, we'll need to double check. But one of the first questions was about licensing. So um, Creator AVR requires licenses mm -hmm. for all individuals that are in the process. Uh, so be it students uh, or, or faculty members or instructional designers. So that's why we did purchase that large chunk of 1,000 1, licenses is to um, provide opportunities for students and faculty members to get access to those licenses. So there is no real difference between both licenses, which makes it possible for students to also create content for a creator EBR. So that's one of the important questions. Emily, please chime in if you have other thoughts uh, as I'm kind of going through the questions. Uh, so I thought that one was quite important. Collaborative uh, submissions. So yes, uh, we do support collaborative submissions or applications. Uh, questions about content. Uh, so content, the openness of the content. So basically, uh, Creator AVR is a proprietary software. So um, what's the experience in Creator AVR is proprietary. 
So it's not open, but the three models that we will be creating through the pilot will be openly available. Um, so that there's kind of a nuance there between what will be publicly openly available after the pilot and what won't be. So the experience itself in creating your VR won't be, but the models themselves that we will be creating through the pilot will be. Um, maybe Emily might have some thoughts about that as well. Um, go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, also, if you are linking to different um, learning materials, so I mentioned that you can put the link to your PowerPoints there, you can link to other media items. I mean, those are also open and definitely it will be able to be accessed after the pilot. Good. Um, other questions? Maybe I'll ask you a question, Emily. Um, mm -hmm. Nicole asks, can we integrate 360 photos within Creator EVR? Um, that's a good question. It, the system does support it. So it supports standard um, 3D file format. So I guess it would depend on the file format. Um, so OBJ files, FXB files, and I think there is another, uh, there's another standard file format that it supports. So if it was in a format that is compatible, then it should work. Thanks for that. Uh, questions about LMS integration. So if I remember correctly, there's not a, like an LTI integration with Creator EVR, but um, I think there's opportunities to use SCORM. I'm not sure, Emily, maybe you have, um, you have the answer to that question. Sorry, about L LTI integration? So LMS integration, oh, the possibility LM of moving content from Creator EVR. <laughs> within the experience of an LMS. Yeah, and this is something I asked too because I know um, that it is, that it's definitely convenient and um, wanted, but with, for the pilot, um, given sort of how fast we want to move with the pilot, it is not possible at this point, but it, 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 it technically is possible, just not for the purposes of our pilot. Okay. Uh, so a couple more. Um, one was how did we choose Eon Reality? So we went through an RFQ process. So we posted this opportunity on our website uh, about a month ago and invited vendors to submit proposals. Uh, so we received some proposals from vendors and evaluated those, had some, some evaluators look at the proposal and um, that's the way we, we chose uh, Eon. Um, other questions about the training. So we had a question about the training. Uh, it seems like obviously like the academic year is pretty full. So there's conflicting activities that the week of October 21st, I think. So uh, one person was asking about how can we uh, get up to speed in terms of creator VR if we're not able to make the training. So the way we um, framed the EOI and the opportunities, at least one member of each institution is so it required to be part of the training session, but there will be some ongoing onboarding activities as well outside of that training session. So yeah. there's I ways for people to kind of right, um, catch up. Yeah, there's, I think, six hours afterwards of virtual um, onboarding training for anybody who wants it in different two hour chunks. Um, and then, of course, there's also ongoing technical um, and customer support over the duration of the pilot. All right, um, another question was about specs. Uh, I think a lot of questions are about the, the, the mobile, mobile specs, so what type of phone is required to run this, and can we run um, VR experiences from Creator VR on HTC Vibes or Oculus Rifts or, or uh, other, other of those kind of devices? So Emily, I know it runs on desktop, it runs on uh, uh, Apple tablets and iOS phones and Android phones yeah. and it does run on um, other type of hardware as well right yeah so uh, definitely any headset where you can put a smartphone into it um, and connect it that way I haven't used it with oculus or anything um, at this point but uh, I think this your your standard um, virtual reality headset where you put a smartphone into it is probably the best um, solution. Um, another question here, I'm looking at the bottom of the group chat, but Tanya is asking that we are awarding six institutions with applications from institutions. 
Uh, what, what if we don't hit the 1,000 license limit? Yeah, and, and I think at that point, then we are open to awarding more. That's kind of our target. But um, we're again, we can't really anticipate how many licenses people are going to ask for. So if we do have a, a lot more to give, then I think, and, and we have those applications, then we will consider the strong applications. And uh, if, if we need to award more, then we will. Um, okay, so I'm browsing through here. Uh... Yeah, so there, there's questions obviously about the end of the pilot. So the end of the pilot is March 31st because that's what we can commit to. Uh, and as we said earlier, uh, the licenses themselves uh, are, are paid licenses. So there would be fees required to maintain your service after March 31st. Um, so we can probably have that conversation offline with people interested in once uh, I just, I'm not comfortable sharing pricing numbers here on the call, but if you guys are, are, are looking at the, having those answers in terms of the EOI, please reach out to us outside of this call. There were just a couple other questions I thought that I yeah. would um, bring up. Um, one, there was a question about if there's a limit on the number of applications per institution, or if I'm, multiple people at an institution could submit different applications. Oh yeah, of course. Of course, we'll consider all applications equally. Great, and then there was another just from Lori about um, if the VR models that are created are open uh, and can be, trans they can be transferred to other environments after, and um, are, are those those standard file formats that you mentioned earlier? Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. So we we do want anything that is created for purposes of this pilot. I mean, not the modules themselves or the, the lessons that are actually in the immersive and interactive environment. But if there are um, models that are created outside of the system, then we definitely want those to be uh, openly licensed. I think that's included in the EOI and they should be able to translate to other environments as well. Great. And there was another question about if there's an opportunity to sort of preview the library of available content before submitting an application so that folks could know um, if it was an appropriate product for them to, to engage with. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, I am, if you, I'm happy to try to find a way to sort of um, give some sort of preview. I could do that offline um, in terms of if you have a question, uh, you're in a specific discipline and you want to know what's in the library, please reach out to me and I can um, sort of give you a sense of that. And I will try to find a way to also, um, if I can find a list of something somewhere, then I will share that with the folks who are on this call and others as well. So I've got one, Emily. Uh, apart from multiple choice questions, can and how can it be used as an evaluation tool? Um, it really, uh, the in terms of evaluation, it is those multiple choice questions, but you can, for any of the other activities that I showed, you can also put a timer on there. Um, and so you can see how long it takes students to do some of those activities. Uh, you can also see, uh, even without a timer, it does sort of keep track of whether or not students were able to complete those activities. So those scores are recorded. Um, and you can see whether or not students are actually, uh, because uh, if I go back to the analytics slide, maybe. Um, so here are the other analytics that you can get from um, Creator ABR. So progress, so whether or not students have actually viewed all of the content and when, um, as well as how long they actually spent on a lesson. So all of that is recorded. And um, so those are, those are some of the key metrics that at least the system um, creates in terms of how else you might use it for an evaluation tool. I think that's sort of depending on your use case and what you're hoping to get out of the pilot. So a couple of questions about license start and stop. Uh, mm -hmm. So when does the license start? Um, Emily, if, if I recall correctly, these licenses will, will all be activated part of the training session at, uh, in, in October, right? Yeah. And the other question is, uh, licenses end on March 31st? Yes, it is. 
it is kind of uh, the, the reality of this pilot is that we can support it until March 31st. So the idea is to frame the testing of it uh, before that date and be able to report before that date. I understand that it's not optimal in terms of the academic calendar, but we work with uh, the resources that we have at our disposal. So that's kind of the framing for the project. Uh, so that's answering Lynn's question about uh, the end date for these licenses. Um, anything else, Lillian? Do you see other questions? Uh, I didn't see any other questions. I'm just um, scrolling through right now, yeah, but I just so wanted to point out, uh, if you can't see the chat, that uh, Kyle has um, mentioned, um, Oh, thank you guys for bringing back up those questions. Kyle mentioned that there is an iOS app for this that has a guest free mode that you might be able to explore a little bit if you want to check it out before submitting an application and see what what's apps at, what's in there. Um, two more questions, Emily. One, um, this is this just for 3D models or is it for immersive simulations as well? It's largely 3D model based. Um, it's not the same sort of simulation that existed with Labster. Um, so yes, it is largely based around models and uh, exploring those. So a couple of other questions, one from Debbie and one from Dan, and we can answer yes to both of those. So Debbie is asking if we can run this in interior learn courses. Absolutely. Uh, Dan is asking, can, is this session being recorded? Yes, it is. <laughs> And just one last thing um, that has come up is the French template. It doesn't have the permissions. Yeah, I think we had issues with the English one as well. So. Um, it, yeah. So, um, Emily, can I ask if you'll send that uh, out along with the link to the recording of the webinar when you're done? <laughs> yes, sorry about that. <laughs> I really thought I changed the permissions, but um, that is my mistake. So, yes, I will fix that. Uh, and there's just one more question. Um, how will students access content after the expiration date of the pilot? Yeah, so um, I mean, if you, again, there is some content that can be open um, in, in terms of if you have a model that can be augmented elsewhere or if you have PowerPoints or, um, you know, other teaching materials that you're linking to within the learning, within the lesson, then those can definitely be accessed after. The other content, um, it does require a license. So if those licenses aren't renewed, then unfortunately students wouldn't be able to access them. I think the, the, the solution there would then just, would be in the course design and how um, Creator AVR is integrated into your courses um, and when you're requiring students to view the different content. There's a question from uh, Matthew here. Uh, are we able to convert pictures, diagram, et cetera, into the simulations? So yes, we can, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, yep. we yep. can. That's kind of the, one of the main uh, attractions for this type of technology is the ability to customize it to our needs. Coming back from Joanne's story about the first pilot and the fact that in the first uh, pilot with Labs, it was a bit more difficult to customize the experience, uh, Eon, um, uh, Creator AVR is already enables that. Is there minimal system internet requirements to use Creator AVR? Emily, do you remember um, any conversations about that? No, I haven't been given certain internet no. requirements. I mean, it does require, it does require internet or to in order to yeah in order to access it um as for like a minimum bandwidth or anything i'm not i'm not sure but i can look into that all right one more question here um since not all students will have access to the appropriate technology or the abilities to use the tool, is it possible to export a video from Creator AVR? I Emily, mean, I know you've kind of answered um, a similar question. But just... 
in terms of exporting um, the actual, I guess this means exporting the lesson. Um, I'm not sure that you can export it. There may be some workarounds in terms of using your devices to actually record a lesson. And I know that that is something that is a concern. So that's definitely something we will be addressing in the onboarding in terms of making sure that this kind of, uh, that all of the content is accessible even if you don't have the tools. So we will be um, exploring and thinking through some of those solutions. All right, so it looks like the chat is slowing down. So I'm going to end this session here. It has been recorded and we will be sharing out the recording as well as those templates, which uh, the permissions were not figured out. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna end it here. If you have any remaining questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And other than that, just a reminder that the applications are due on October 7th that is next Monday to the procurement address that is on the slide. And uh, we look forward to reading what you've put together and to working with you all later on. Thank you. Thanks, Emily.